as we close this series called Beyond the Science, this has been a fruitful six weeks uh, message about the miracles of Jesus. And I, I hope if you've been attending with us the past few Sundays, I hope it built up your faith, it edified you more, and help you have a bigger perspective of who Jesus is. As I, as I close, I got reminded of a basketball game. How many of you, are, you follow NBA? Okay, you, okay, some of us. Uh, some of us, Patintero or, or other sport. And Oh, two days from now, the playoffs is starting. So how many of you are Warriors fans are still in faith? You're going to win, right? The Cavs. Cavs, any? The losers in the place? Come on. Yeah, come on. Okay, I'm just kidding. I remember the basketball game, uh, 17 now, and so it was 2013 years ago. 13 years ago of uh, a game between San Antonio Spurs and the Houston Rockets. Now, you watch that game, the Spurs was actually leading. The last few seconds, they were like eight, had an eight-point lead against the Houston Rockets. So if you watch the video or the game, the replay of that, you'll see that it's already obvious that the Spurs will win. It's, it's a close deal. Not until I remember a player who was popular at that time. I don't know if he's still playing now. Tracy McGrady, who actually played for the Houston Rockets. The last 35 seconds of that game, while the Spurs was leading eight points, he actually made 13 straight points. The last 13, or the last 33 seconds. Can you imagine that? There was a last switch of momentum. The Spurs was leading. They were, they were winning. But then, all of a sudden, the Houston Rockets had this Tracy McGrady. Last few seconds, turned the game around, and then, voila, behold, the Houston Rockets won. One point. Okay, so it was a sure deal, but all of a sudden, there was a turnaround, and it seemed what seemed like a late switch of momentum actually turned out to be a sweet victory. It was actually a victory that was unexpected. You never thought that that, that team will win. I share that story to us, this video, is because I got reminded of a story that we're going to talk about today. The story is it seems Jesus was late. You ever experienced that in your life where you felt like God was late? You were asking God to do something for you at this time based on your expectations, but didn't happen. And I, the story, as we summarize, because it's a long verse, I'll just summarize it. Jesus had three friends, or maybe more than, but in this story, it involves his three friends. Lazarus, who was sick, and the two sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Jesus was actually ministering in the Jordan region, which is far from Bethany where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus lived. So happened, the message was urgent. They were asking Jesus, wherever he was in the Jordan region, to come back, to go back to Bethany and heal their brother Lazarus. So Mary and Martha Facebook messaged Jesus. <laughs> they actually texted Jesus to come and we need your help because our brother is sick. Now, you wouldn't ask help from Jesus if your situation is not really dire. You wouldn't ask help. And the message will not be urgent if you feel like Lazarus just had colds. Or maybe Lazarus just had sore throat. I don't think that's urgent enough to ask and inconvenience Jesus to come to your place. The reason why they asked Jesus to come to their place and heal their brother Lazarus, because Lazarus' sickness was actually critical. He was actually the point of dying. And so this is what happened in the story. When he received, Jesus received the message that Lazarus needed help, he intentionally and deliberately delayed so instead of coming to Lazarus or going to Lazarus ASAP, he actually stayed in the Jordan River or in that region two more days. Until it came to a point after two days, he went to Lazarus' place to heal him and to find out, when you look at the story, of course, Jesus knows what happened. He's God. But then when he came, 
the people and the loved ones of Lazarus were already there because Lazarus was dead. And he's been dead for four days. La Jesus was approaching the village and Martha, the sister of Lazarus, was so frustrated, saddened by her loss. Uh, of course, her brother died. Ito si Martha, medyo vocal. You know any people like that? You have a friend like that who's very vocal? They'll, not vocal, a vocal. You know, when they express things and they won't keep it. They'll, whatever is inside, they'll really say it. And so Martha was like that. She was kind of straight to the point to Jesus. So when she saw Jesus arriving at the scene two days late, this is what Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If Patrick Mercado, if I'm the one who's talking to Jesus, and I'm also might be, maybe saddened and frustrated, maybe if you're in the place of Martha, you'll actually say to Jesus or tell Jesus in a more direct to the point. Alam mo sinasabi ni Martha dito? Simple lang. You're late. I was actually, and my sister was actually asking you from help maybe a few days before he actually died. So you had more time, Lord Jesus. You had more time to heal my brother, but you came here late. Bakit? In other more bargas version, you'll say, Lake BV. You're late. You delayed it. Of course, Mary was crying in the house, and when she found out, Jesus was already in the area. She actually approached Jesus too. So the two sisters had the same sentiment and this is what they told Jesus. They told Jesus, or Mary, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, same line, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Dead end situation. Of course, when you lose a loved one, some of us, or maybe all of us here lost a loved one, when you lose a loved one and I'm not just talking about unconscious. I'm talking about your loved one getting or being buried. There's finality, right? When you bury, there's a disconnect. There's a detachment already. That's why it sinks in when your loved one... So Lazarus was actually buried already for four days. So all, but the, all you just have to do is when you're in a dead-end situation like this, what are you going to do? Accept and complain? Move on. Move on abyss. You move on. That's the situation. It's a dead end. So their sentiment and their frustration actually came out. So the fact that they saw this miracle worker named Jesus, this powerful prophet named Jesus, this God named Jesus, they just had to pour it out and say, you're late. You could have done something different when you were here. If only you were here. Now we can relate it to our situation, right? If only you were here. If only you answered my prayer, Lord, about my business, I will not be so stressed about this now. If only you did something in my marriage, I wouldn't be so stressed about it. When we're in a dead-end situation, ladies and gentlemen, we entertain those what-ifs. And it's only normal for us, people, to entertain those questions. What if? What if? What if I did this? What if I picked this course when I was in college? Or maybe what if I, I tried, I prayed more? Or what if I, I went to church earlier? Or what if I got to know Jesus when I was a teenager? Right? We all have what ifs when we're in a dead-end situation. And they were in a dead-end situation. So they were telling Jesus, Lord, if you were just here, it could have turned out differently. You ever felt that? Sometimes when we ask God, Lord, I've been asking you for these things. I've been asking you for this breakthrough and it seems like you're late. God is just relaxing on his throne and maybe he's busy with other people. And when I pray to him, it doesn't happen. One theologian said that uh, God must, must have been a Filipino. <laughs> that theologian is me. Remember, four signs, four evidences. One was in Genesis. Remember the original name of Abraham? What was it? Abram. But when Abraham had a covenant with God, and God changed the name of Abraham to, diba we love putting H in our names? Jen, Jen. Jordan, Jordan. 
God put an H in Abraham's name. Abraham. And then also an evidence when Jesus, remember the story of Jesus with his disciples? They were in the boat and it was stormy. Storm, there was probably a qual. So there was a torrent and then they were afraid. It was raining and the disciples were panicking. What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. Just like Filipinos. When there's a typhoon, we sleep. <laughs> of course, the third sign is this. The, the sisters were asking Jesus to come now. Two days late. Okay, I hope it gets redeemed, it gets redeemed the, Filipino, the Filipino time. I hope it gets redeemed. And this is the solid, sound doctrine of all. We love, put, we love repeating our names, right? Pat Pat, Len Len, Weng Weng, Mik Mik. Jesus had that situation too, right? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? No, just like that. Okay, anyway, why did I say that? Why did I say that? Just to kill time. I, that's I, the reason I, I shared that, just to kill time, to fill it in my sermon notes. No, I, I share that to us because when you experience a person who's always late, it's frustrating, especially when you desperately need something from him or from her. If you're a businessman, it frustrates you when your client pays late. Or when you have a meeting in your corporate world, you're going to meet with someone at 9 in the morning and he arrives at 10 and that contract is very important, right? So it frustrates and disappoints us when someone is late and the sisters actually felt like that. It's like, are you, are you a perfect God? I thought you know all things. I know you, you provide the right things. I, hope you're in, I know you're in control, but it seems like you're not. Maybe you're busy ministering with other people, and I felt like you didn't really answer or hear me, and you actually didn't answer, period. You're late. All of us go through this journey that sometimes we feel God is late. He does things differently. But the reason why Jesus delayed himself is because he had a purpose. He was actually going to perform a sign, a sign that will actually shock everyone, especially the two sisters and the people around them. So we're going to see as, as, we, as this story unfolds, simple story of how Christ performs this miracle. You're going to see some amazing qualities in Jesus. That all of us, I hope, gets encouraged that whatever we're going through tonight, whatever season you're in, you're in a season of waiting and a season of claiming something from God. I hope we, as we study the qualities we'll discover in this story of Jesus, you'll see that Christ is actually near to us. He's actually not late. He actually knows what he's doing. Let's look at that as this story unfolds. Simple, very short passage of how God, Jesus, performs this sign where you're in a dead-end situation already. Then he performs this sign. Verse 38 then Jesus deeply moved again. He was there. There was actually a wake. The person was buried already, Lazarus. So there was a gathering among the loved ones and the neighbors visited. In short, in Tagalog, parang lamay. We do that in our culture. So he, he was there. But you would see here, they were in a dead-end situation. They just have to move on and accept reality. But Jesus deeply moved again. That means he felt something. The sadness of Mary and Martha, the frustration and the disappointment of the sisters, the misery that they were experiencing, or maybe the tears, the bucket of tears that fell from the sisters and the loved one's eyes. Jesus felt that because he, he was moved deeply. And here, here's a word, deeply moved again. So that means there's a precedent. If it's again, there's something that happened before this. And so it was a cave and totally, and a stone lay again. So the moment he got nearer to the body that was buried, there's something that he felt. The same feeling that those loved ones felt. The empathy of Christ. I think that's something that we can get reminded of. That the God that we worship, if you are in a dead-end situation and you feel like nothing can be done, 
You've been crying and crying over the situation. You've been frustrated just like Mary and Martha. And you felt God treated you unfairly. Remember this. Christ empathizes with us. He feels our pain. Imagine a God who feels your pain. Oh, not only that. What was the precedent? John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Theologians will say this is the shortest verse. One of the shortest verses, but full of meaning. He wept. Can you imagine the God that we serve, Christ with us? It's interesting, last week we talked about Jesus spitting. Now Jesus crying tonight. Gives you a greater revelation of Jesus that His humanity, connection to humanity, and He became human like us, and He's also divine, but He's able to feel your sadness, the frustration, your misery, your pain. He wept. He can feel your pain. Even if you look at the Old Testament, He sees the suffering of His people, and He wants to do something about it. I know, now I know that one of the infinite reasons why there's an Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is because Jesus exactly knows the, the misery, the sadness that death brings. We all lost a loved one, so we know what we're... We don't like death. We, it's BV, pare. We don't like the feeling of losing a loved one and seeing them in the hospital bed or maybe in the house where the last breath you were there and you were just crying and you, he's no more. We don't... Jesus exactly felt. That's why he wept. He was mourning with the sisters. The pain of, of loss. The tears that death brings. The misery. And we don't want that. But Jesus wept. He feels you. One of the challenging jobs of a pastor is actually doing a necrological service. So I've done that a few times where uh, a church member or maybe my loved one, they ask me to do a memorial service. It's one of the challenging jobs because sometimes my question when I enter that funeral or that chapel, what do I say? What am I going to say? They're crying there. They're in deep pain. They all have questions for sure. Why did this happen? Where will he go? Is it in heaven or in hell? Sorry to be, di- sorry, sorry to be direct. And so what will I say? What, what, how, what can will I minister? And I realize when you talk about this, Jesus wept. At the point of losing a loved one, the God that we serve knows how to cry and he can actually empathize with us. This is something good. So when you're in a dead-end situation, let me tell you this. Yes, you're frustrated. Yes, you're disappointed. Yes, you're getting impatient. The Lord knows exactly how you feel. And he's there. Greek mythologies will teach us, remember Zeus and... Eastern religions, God, gods will just stay in Olympus or in heaven, wherever they are, just to be comfortable. A god will not come down here on earth because they think that earth is dirty. So when John wrote this, the Greeks were reading actually, and so the Greeks, when they looked at the book of John, and they say, this is a different god. Zeus does not even cry probably. The gods that they serve and they worship are just comfortable there while the humans are suffering. But when they when Greeks and pagans read this, that Jesus is what? The God that you're saying, Jesus is a God and comes down here, and you're telling me he cries, and then you're telling me he spits on the ground to heal a blind man. And you're, he's here on earth, a dirty material, but he's here. Something else. It encourages us all the more that the God that we worship is always with you and feeling you and empathizes with you whatever your difficulties or your challenges are. That's what he did to the sisters of Mary. He mourned with them. This alone is already a message. And this is more than enough to give us a background of who God is. Not someone who you can't relate with. Not someone who's detached from humanity but someone that can really see your pain. Jesus wept. So he was moved. What happened next? Take away the stone, Martha. 
The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days. And, and so Jesus was deeply moved in his emotions. He's going to do something about it. He's going to break natural laws because natural law says, natural law says what? If you're dead, that's it. It's, the, it's game over if you're dead. But then Jesus was deeply moved and him being God, nothing is impossible with him. So what does he do? He'll do something that will shock everyone. Now I know one of the infinite reasons of Easter. Let me say that again. He overcame death so that we will not have to experience the eternal misery of death. So Easter Sunday is a reminder that the God that we worship is a God who overcame death. This is what every Christian believes. That when you die, it's not the end of your life. That when you die, you go to heaven. And if you, had, you died of cancer, maybe you died of something, of a disease, when you're in heaven, you have resurrected bodies and you have perfect ones. That's immortal. That's what, you're, that's what these Christians were holding on to, especially when they were facing persecutions, life and death. They know they will live again because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus was going to do something that's impossible. So he said, remove, take away the stone. And then Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? In verse 41, it says, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And this is something we can learn from Jesus. But when you're in a deadened situation and you feel like God is not doing anything and he's late, there's a key word there. I thank you that you have heard me. That's an assurance that God doesn't just feel us. He hears our prayers. And not only that, let me go back in verse 40. Believe. Believe that He's there and that He hears us. This is something, an application for us that if you feel like this, it's normal. I feel that too sometimes. If you feel you're in that situation, you believe and get assured that He hears you. And what happens next in verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. He's going to do a perf- He will perform a sign in short, he will raise the dead. That's something different. Because the last six weeks that we've been talking about, Jesus performing a miracle, but him being a provider. So he fed the 5,000 provider. So he, he, that's a miracle already. Uh, not only that, he healed. So the last six weeks, we understood that Jesus is a healer and a provider. But this is something else. He's not a healer or a provider. He's a life or a dead raiser. Wow, that's scary. That can be a horror title movie. He can be a dead racer or a life racer to be more positive. But the key word there is that those, so that people, I will perform the sign. I will raise Lazarus from the dead who's been dead for four days in the tomb. I will raise him so that what? To impress people? No, no. So that they'll believe in me, that you sent me, Christ's authority. This is something else. The miracles that we talked about last week, implies that he has authority over our needs. That's why he's a provider. He turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000. And not only that, that's why he healed the people and healed the blind, healed the official son. And so he's over sicknesses. He's God of your needs and he's God over your sicknesses. But this is something else. He's God over life and death. He's not just the author of life. He's the judge of the living and the dead. And so this is something that will shock Mary and Martha. Oh, kaya rin pala gawin yun. Yung, you know, ever watched a uh, TV, what do you call that? Judge it, yung they introduce a product in the TV. Infomercial, no, no, TV shopping. Remember that statement of that MC will say, but wait, there's more. So this is a story of, but wait, there's more. I'm not just a healer. I'm not just a provider. <laughs> I'm actually a dead racer. Have ever seen Walking Dead? Now that's scary, but this is something else. I'm the resurrection and the life. Christ's authority is supreme and it supersedes everything. And I want us to be assured of that. If Christ, Easter Sunday, if Christ overcame death, then who can overcome Christ? 
Because the last and ultimate enemy is death and sin. But he overcame that, so Christ is our ultimate champion. And so if you compare that biggest enemy to your trials now, how many of you here are thankful that nothing is impossible with God? He can deliver you from your trials. He overcame death already. What else? What else do you need? What are some of the things that we go through? I know it's tough. Marriage restoration. Emotional healing to some of the single people here. Or maybe married people also. <laughs> Parents to children relationship, the restoration. Household salvation. Financial breakthrough. What else do you need? Because if Christ overcame and provided for the greatest need, eternal life, how much more are the secondary ones? And it's a good reminder for us people, church, my friends, that God will take care of you no matter what happens. Amen? Amen. He has authority over everything. We can give God praise for that. That's Easter. That's what Easter Sunday is all about. That's what Easter Sunday is all about. That's why He died for us and was raised after three days as a preview that whenever we believe in Him, that will also happen to us. That when we die, we will get resurrected and we're given new bodies and we're given eternal life. If He provided for that, how much more are the problems with your business? How much more are the problems you're facing in your career? How much more are the problems you're facing now, maybe in your family, your finances? You can be assured that He's taking care of it. Christ's authority. And what He's actually saying here is this. Resurrection is not just an event. Let's look at that in John eleven twenty five, 25 when Jesus was actually conversing with um, Mary and Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And this is what the sisters actually said. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, the, of God who is coming into the world. There was a lack of understanding. It wasn't wrong. The Jews believed that there's a resurrection that will take place. But something was lacking. They only looked at Jesus as a healer and as a provider. Not as someone who will pull the trigger for the resurrection to take place. What Jesus is actually saying is this, I am the resurrection. Without me, there's no resurrection. So what he's actually saying to the, to the girls is, you're believing for a future event, but with, I am the person who will cause that event. It's like you're believing for something, a concert, but the performer's not there. You ever went to a concert and the performer didn't show up? No, of course not. And so what actually Jesus is saying is, you believe in the resurrection, but for the resurrection to happen, I am He. I'm the one who will pull that trigger to, for that to happen. And you're going to see that to your brother in a little while. That's what actually he's saying. And what happens next in verse 43? When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. He prayed to God, but then he cried out with a loud voice, talking to the tomb, okay, with the op open tomb, with the, the, door, the, sto the stones was re stone was removed, and it says, Lazarus, come out. No, no, with a loud voice. No, I might break the speakers if I shout. But then in verse 44, the man who died, Lazarus, came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind them and let him go. More of like a comedy here now. Obviously, Lazarus can't jump. He's tied with bandages. So it's like the mummy. You ever watch the mummy? Okay. And so maybe what Jesus was saying, can you make sure, remove the tape, I just want to look at the face and I, I want to make sure if I raise the right person. <laughs> but then that's what actually Jesus did. <laughs> By the power of His Word, it brought life to the dead man's body. Lazarus, four days. It only speaks of Christ's ability. 
So when you're in a dead-end situation, you're disappointed, feel like, oh man, my dreams, it's dead. My hopes are dead. Remember this. Christ empathizes with you. Christ has authority over everything in your life. Even the most, the most scary or scariest thing in your life. But lastly, he has the ability. It's, re- it's a reminder that he has infinite abilities. If you ever watched, remember Tracy McGrady. Now that's a very, very poor illustration of what Christ can do. But then he can do anything. Even, I'm not going to use turnaround. And I always say this in our congregation, turnaround specialist. You ever heard of that, right? You heard that. But that's, this is not a turnaround specialist. What you're actually talking about is, it's actually dead. How can you turn around someone that's dead? Because turn around is still living. May pulso pa eh. May chance pa eh. But this story is actually not turning around. This story is actually raising the dead and giving it new life, which is what Easter Sunday is all about. How many of you are glad that God has given you new life? Amen. He's our resurrection. He's our salvation. You receive Jesus in your life. Your soul is secure. And He has given you new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It's a reminder. And daming reminders ng Easter. One, one, one thing that I get reminded also is the God of newness. He's a God of new things. He's not a God of old and dead things. He's a God of new things. Always thrives in life when you have Jesus. You can have the title King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of the world, but if you don't have the ability or the power to back up your claim, you're nothing. You know, some Filipinos, I'm not going to mention which department, some of us, when we drive, we disregard traffic enforcers. Right? Don't raise your hands if you're guilty. You counterflow even if there's a traffic enforcer. You know he's the authority. He has the authority. He can actually confiscate your ticket. But for some reason, we're not just afraid of those authorities. Why? Because they don't have the power to back it up. Now, if it's, I saw some highway patrol group here a few Sundays ago. I confessed. No, not of course. I'm honest. But, when you, but if it's highway patrol group trafficking or enforcing it in Esa, when they have like armalites and guns, if they ask you to stop, you will stop. Why? They have the power to back up their claim, power and authority. That's what you mean by when Jesus said he has the power, power to back it up, the authority, the title. You can have the title, but you cannot, it's possible you don't have the ability to enforce that title. With this story in mind, when he performed the sign, Jesus did both and has both. He has power and he has authority. When he said he's the God and the, of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he can raise that dead person into being alive again. I'm going to end here. You know, going back to my question, is God late? Thinks God sometimes is late? Actually, not. He's not. Comes at the right time. But here's something I want to leave you. I said a lot of things, but here's something I want to leave you. When He comes in your life, He will actually raise your dead situation. And when He raises that dead situation, you will know He is God. This is the story of resurrection. That whatever dead situation you're facing, listen, He can raise that. Okay? He can raise that. Or maybe you're dead in your soul. He can raise that. So that when He raises that, you will not be glorified. He will turn your dead situation into something what? A glorious situation. And at the end of the day, there's beauty and glory in your life because people will see God in you. How many of you are claiming that? Amen? He will turn your dead situation into a glorious one. Let's all stand.
I want to pray for us if you're here. Feel like you're in a dead situation. Hopeless. In fact, I sense, I, I didn't do this in the 6 p.m., but I just sense some of us gave up some dreams and already. Just sense that. You've been praying about something impossible, but parang hindi pa nangyari. Hasn't happened yet. And you buried that like Lazarus. You buried those dreams already. I don't know. Maybe a perfect love life. Maybe a thriving career. Maybe marriage restoration. You, you buried that already. You put it in the tomb or maybe in a safe vault. Never to be opened again. Because when you mo, you just get frustrated. I want to get reminded today, Easter Sunday message. Listen, we can resurrect those dreams again and we can believe God that He will do something great in your life. If He did something impossible, death, He overcame it, He can also overcome the situation you're going through. So I want to encourage all of us here. Never give up on the dreams and the things you're believing God for. Because He's there. He has infinite abilities. Let's pray for that. In fact, if that's you, lift both your hands. I want to pray for us. You've given up. Lord, you see our hands. Pray, Lord God, that you will resurrect those dreams. Resurrect those faith goals. I know we got frustrated, we got disappointed. You'll resurrect that. And I pray that you will put a new level of faith in our hearts. That as a family, as a couple, we will, we will believe God again. No matter, even if it's hard or how long it takes, we'll cling to that. Because you did that for Lazarus, you, you're going to do that for your children, Lord. And so whatever those dreams are, you'll resurrect that. We have a hope in eternity. We can actually hope for today. And we can actually hope for tomorrow while we're living on this earth. Thank you for what you've done for us. Let's all lift our hands to God as we get dismissed. Lord, I pray that you will stir up faith, hope, and joy. I pray, Lord, that we will not look at you as a God who comes late. A God who's detached from us. A God who's disconnected, Lord. No, you empathize with us. Help us feel that, that you're close to us. That you have authority over all things. You're in control. And you're the one who's the resurrection and the life. You have those abilities, Lord. So we're going to cling to you this coming week. Maybe the next coming weeks or months. We'll cling to you. Because nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Thank you that you are our resurrection and life. You can live a life of faith and hope. Not just today, but even tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, for your good, your faithful, your gracious. Nothing is impossible with you. You overcame death. We are serving and worshiping a champion, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.